الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الصلاة والسلام عليك يا رسول الله وعلى آلك وأصحابك يا حبيب الله الصلاة والسلام عليك يا نبي الله وعلى آلك وأصحابك يا نور الله Welcome dear viewers to another episode of our program Fortunate Believers and in this program we are discussing those noble verses of the Quran where Allah Azza wa Jal calls out the believers addresses the believers by saying Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu Inshallah in this episode we'll mention another verse which begins with Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu but before that let us hear an excellence of reciting Salat upon the beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam The beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that the most closest to me on the day of judgment will be the one who recited the most salat upon me. Subhanallah. Think about that for a moment. That if you want proximity to the Prophet ﷺ on Yom Al Qiyamah, and he is our savior, he is our intercessor, our master, he is the one who will lead us to salvation. And behind him, sallallahu alayhi wa we will enter Jannah, inshallah. To gain closeness to Rasulullah ﷺ on Yom Al Qiyamah is a great honor indeed, the greatest honor. How do we attain that? We recite Salat ala nabi in abundance. Kathratu Salati ala nabi. Inshallah, we will be close to our beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on the day of judgment. May Allah give us tawfiq to recite Salawat in abundance. Sallu ala al-Habib Sallallahu Ta'ala ala Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala states in Surah Nisa verse 29. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. يا أيها الذين آمنوا لا تأكلوا أموالكم بينكم بالباطل إلا أن تكون تجارة عن تراض منكم ولا تقتلوا أنفسكم إن الله كان بكم رحيما. Translation: O believers, do not unfairly consume the wealth of each other, except that it is a trade by your mutual agreement, and do not kill yourselves. By committing murder or suicide, etc. Indeed, Allah is most merciful upon you. Now, in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about not using the wealth of others unlawfully, not taking their wealth unlawfully. And this has many forms taking someone's wealth through interest, taking wealth unlawfully through gambling, through theft, through usurping someone's land, through Swearing a false oath, for example, being dishonest, being treacherous, uh, earning unlawful wealth, haram wealth through uh, music or singing songs, etc. All of these things fall under uh, this verse. And also included in this, meaning unlawfully consuming wealth, taking wealth, is uh, earning wealth and then spending it in sin, spending it in disobedience. So this has been mentioned in the verse. Alongside this, the shari'i way of spending, the shari'i way of earning wealth, illa an takuna tijaratan an taradin minkum. That through trade, through tijara, through business, you can earn wealth lawfully. And this is pure for you. This is not a haram means. And then towards then, Allah Jalla wa ala speaks about uh, not killing yourselves. And we will discuss what the implication of that part of the verse is. To begin, the condemnation of earning haram wealth. Now, haram wealth is not accepted if you spend it in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you were to consume it, there are so many harms as well. Let us hear some narrations in this regard. In Musnad of Imam Ahmad, Sayyiduna Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu anhu narrates that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, the person who acquires haram wealth, it will not be accepted from him if he gives it in charity. And if he spends it, there is no blessing in it for him. And if he dies, leaving it behind him, it is a means of entering hell. Allah Almighty does not remove evil with evil. However, he does remove evil with a good deed. Indeed, the impure does not remove the impure. So this hadith we're told, if you give haram wealth in charity, it's not accepted. There's no blessing in the haram wealth for a person. If he dies, he leaves it behind for his heirs, his family members to use then this is a means of him entering hell. He did not leave halal wealth for them. Another narration, Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anh narrates that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, Allah Almighty has forbidden paradise for that body that is nurtured on haram food. A person is nourished by haram food. 
So Allah Jalla wa Ala has prohibited that body that is nourished by haram from entering paradise. Such a great warning and a big lesson, a big advice, instruction to earn only halal, to eat halal and make sure your body is nurtured and nourished only by halal food. Another narration, this is in Mu'ajam al awsat the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to Sayyiduna Sa'ad radiallahu an, O Sa'ad, purify your diet, you will become mustajab with da'awat. Meaning someone whose every dua is accepted. By the being in whose might the life of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is, when a person puts a morsel of haram in his stomach, his good deeds for 40 days are not accepted. His good deeds that he did over 40 days are not accepted. And the person whose flesh is nurtured with haram, fire is better for him. Allah Look at the warning again in this hadith and also a formula to have your du'as accepted. People today say, I do du'a, I don't see the reply of that du'a, I don't see the du'a is accepted. Focus on what is going in your mouth, what you're eating. Only halal should go in your mouth. Inshallah, that is a means of your du'as being accepted. In fact, we'll become mustajab al-da'wat. Every du'a will be accepted, Allah willing. And another narration, Sayyidina Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala, he stated that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa mentioned a person who takes a long journey. His hair is disheveled, his clothes are torn, he's covered with dust, and he's proclaiming, Ya Rabbi, Ya Rabbi, O Lord, O Lord. And he's raising his hands towards the sky. But his food is haram, his drink is haram, his clothing is haram. Then how is his supplication going to be answered? This is a hadith of Sayyid Muslim. How is that person's supplication going to be answered? The ulama say that Bazahir seemingly that person has all the traits of a person whose du'as are accepted. That he's a traveler in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is needy. He is suffering. Uh, he's broken hearted. He's raising his hands in the court of Allah jalla wa ala. But how is he going to be accepted if all of that is too haram? Clothing is haram. Food is haram. Drink is haram. Then there's no chance of his du'as being accepted. So these were a few narrations in regards to the importance of earning halal and staying away from haram wealth, haram risk. And then the verse goes on to state, Illa an takuna tijaratan an taradim minkum. That yes, if you were to do trade business and earn wealth, that is fine. An taradim minkum. It has to be through mutual consent. You can't forcibly take someone's shop, someone's land, someone's property, someone's wealth. No, it has to be with mutual consent. And when you have mutual consent, the Sharia permits that and it's allowed. And when you earn through that means, you'll have blessings in that wealth. And inshallah, you'll earn the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So buying and selling is the common means. A person buys from someone, a person sells to someone. This is what we see in the world. When you go to marketplaces, you have the shopkeepers who are selling, you have the customers who are purchasing and buying. Now because this is, you could say, the most prevalent way of tijara, trade, buying and selling. Although there are so many ways nowadays, providing a service, for example, uh, your skills, there are other ways as well. But generally, when we speak of tijara, we speak of buying and selling. So in this regard, it's very important for a tajid, a tradesman, a businessman to know about the rulings of sharia in regards to trading. And he knows about the etiquettes about trading. If he doesn't, he's going to fall into sin time and time again. But inshallah, in this regard, I would like to mention uh, firstly, the virtues of trading and then the etiquette adab. And those adab, a lot of them fall into fard acts that a trader must do. It's not optional on him. First of all, the the blessing of trading and being a businessman. In Tirmidhi, Sayyidina Abu Sa'id Khudri an has narrated that the Prophet ﷺ said, A truthful and honest trader will be with the Prophet ﷺ, the Siddiqeen, the most truthful, and the martyrs. Subhanallah. Look at the companionship he will gain on the Day of Judgment because of his truthfulness when trading. In Tafsir Dure Manthur, Sayyidina Mu'adh bin Jabal radiallahu an has narrated that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, those traders have a pure earning who do not lie while speaking. If they make a promise, they do not break it. When something is entrusted to them, they do not misappropriate it. When they buy something, they do not talk bad about it. When they sell something, they do not praise it. They do not exaggerate. When they owe something to someone, they do not hesitate in paying it. And when they are owed something from someone, they do not constrict that person. Another hadith which is in Tirmidhi. The Prophet wasallam said, On the day of judgment, the traders will be resurrected as transgressors. Except that trader who fears Allah Almighty, 
does good and speaks the truth. Subhanallah. And a last narration, Sayyidina Huzaifa radiallahu anhu has narrated that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, amongst the people before you, there was a person whom an angel visited to seize his soul. So he was told, have you done any good deed? That person replied, I do not know. And then he was told, ponder, think about it. And he said, I do not know anything except the fact that in the world, I used to trade with people. I used to do trading with people. And when I would demand my money from them, I would give respite to the rich and would forgive the poor. Allah Akbar. Allah Almighty said, O oh, angels, forgive him to Subhanallah. This is in the Musnad of Imam Ahmad. That this person was forgiven because of his good treatment of others. He was a tajib, he was a businessman. He would give respite to the wealthy and he would forgive the poor. And because of this trait, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala forgave him too as well. So now that you've heard about the excellence of trading and trading lawfully, businessmen who carry out their trade in accordance to Sharia, there are so many fadai. We just touched upon a few narrations there. Now the etiquettes of trading. And as I mentioned, these etiquettes are not simply those that if adopted, it's good. On many occasions, a lot of these are fard to implement as well. So please listen carefully. First of all, Every day in the morning, what should be the intention of a trader, a businessman? When he goes to work, what should he intend? He should say in his heart, I am going to the marketplace so that I may be able to feed my family and become independent of others. And I am able to attain such leisure time in which I worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and remain on the path of the hereafter. This is the intention one should have in the morning. Moreover, he should also make the following intentions. I will treat people with affection, sincerity and honesty. I will enjoin good and forbid evil and will take the dishonest to account. The second thing, a businessman should be able to recognize counterfeit money and authentic real money. Why? Otherwise he'll be deceived himself and he'll be passing that money on. He'll be deceiving others unknowingly as well. So to save himself and to save the other Muslims, he should be able to recognize between counterfeit money and genuine currency. Another other etiquette manner of trading is that if someone gives you a counterfeit uh, coin or a counterfeit note, then it should not be given to others. And if you find out who gave it, then you should not return it to him either. In fact, you should dispose of it. Why? Because if you give it back to that person who gave it to you in the first place, he will go on to give it to someone else. So look at Islam. Islam wants you to value the rights of others. Save others from falling into hardship. So subhanallah, this is a beautiful teaching of Islam that if you receive fake coins, fake money, then dispose of it. And don't even return it to the person who gave it you initially. Another etiquette is that you should not overly praise your goods just to get them sold. And some people do that. They have a habit of overly praising. And then when the customer buys it and he uses it, he realizes that person was lying just to get his item sold. And you're not going to do dua for you, of course. So do not overly praise your goods. This is lying and deception. And another etiquette that one should not purchase defective goods in the first place. So defective goods, for example, you, you sell online, you're involved in e-commerce, for example, and you're buying items that have damaged packaging. You should state that. You should mention that. Last thing you want is the buyer to uh, receive it and then realize, wait a minute, the packaging is damaged. Someone might argue that he's going to open it anyway. So what does it matter? What if that person ordered it to give it as a gift to someone else? But he's ordering that to gift someone for their birthday. Is he going to give an item which has damaged packaging? Obviously, that's not the way that people do things. People want the packaging to be nice. People uh, want it to be in pristine condition. So we must state these things. And then if we state all the ayub, the defects in a product or an item, and then sell it, and the customer is aware of all of these things, that's fine then. You have not wronged him. Because he has willingly bought it after you stated all of this. When uh, weighing and measuring, a person should not be fraudulent in this regard. He should not cheat others. He should not deceive others. He should weigh and measure fully. And only then hand over the products. Another etiquette that we should keep in mind is we should never lie. And it happens that sometimes someone asks you, uh, lower the price of this item for me to X amount. And the seller will say, no, I can't because 
it cost me X amount. And he knows it did not cost him X amount. But just to make the customer think that he's not making a profit on an item, he'll say, it cost me X amount. Whereas he knows he bought it for a lot less than that. And if he were to sell it to the customer at a price that he wants, he will still be making profit, but he just desires to make more profit. So there he has to choose his words carefully. He can't say, oh, I bought it for this much, even though he knows I did not buy the item for that amount. Another beautiful other etiquette of trading is that when you buy, Islam encourages to buy of a needy seller, a person who, for example, has just started his business or his business is not as successful as others. He's struggling. If you buy from him, subhanAllah, you'll enter happiness into his heart. You'll be pleasing that Muslim. And inshallah, you'll gain blessings in your uh, trade as well. You'll gain blessings in your risk as well. And he will make dua for you. A person who owes money to a creditor, he should pay the money before that person insists. And he should not wait until that person comes knocking on his door. Where's my money? Where's my money? He should give. If he has the money and he has the istifara ability to give, he should give it to him. So subhanAllah, another beautiful thing that the ulama have written, the marketplace where you carry out tijara, business and trade should not stop you from the marketplace of the hereafter. What are the marketplaces of the hereafter? The masajid, the houses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Meaning your business should not prevent you from worshipping Allah Azza wa Jalla. And the Sahaba radiallahu anhum ajma'in in the Quran have been praised and they have this characteristic that رِجَادٌ لَا تُلْهِيهِمْ تِجَارَةٌ وَلَا بَيْعٌ عَنْ ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ وَإِقَامِ الصَّلَاهِ وَإِيْتَاءِ الزَّكَاةِ That the Sahaba were such men who were not distracted by bay' by tijara, by trading. They were not distracted through trade and business from dhikrullah, from praying salah, from worshipping Allah, from remembering Allah from establishing prayer, from giving zakat, all of this has been mentioned in praise of the Sahaba radiallahu anhu majma'in. That our trade, our business should not make us heedless of the hereafter. And it shouldn't be the case that a person, he is the first to go to the marketplace and the last to leave. You know, we should, we should spend as much time there as is required. If we make enough money for the day, then devote the rest of the time for the deen, for the dhikrullah azza wa jal, for the religion of Islam. So these were a few etiquettes and there are plenty more we should study them, especially for those who are going into the field, who are in the field of trade and business. They must ensure that they know these things. Otherwise, they'll be deceiving others. They might be deceived themselves. And it'll be a, very difficult for them to save themselves from sins. Now moving on, and the, the second part of the verse, وَلَا تَقْتُلُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ And do not kill yourself. Now what this means, according to the Mufassirun, and in Tafsir Khazin it states, that do not do certain actions that will cause destruction for you in the world and in the hereafter. Let us hear about those various things. Number one, Muslims killing each other. Muslims kill each other, they're destroying their dunya and their akhirah. And there are repercussions from a shari'i point of view when you take the life of a fellow Muslim as well. And when we look at the hadith collection, we're told that Muslims are merciful to each other. Muslims are like one body. For example, in a narration of Bukhari, Sayyidina Nu'aman bin Bashir, Radiallahu anhu raised that the Prophet ﷺ said, You will see the Muslims resembling one body in regards to them being merciful to each other, uh, being friends with each other, and showing kindness. They will resemble one body. And when pain is inflicted on any part of the body, then the whole body shares the sleeplessness and fever with it. Meaning, when Muslims are affected in one part of the world, we also feel bad. We also grieve. And we, we share their pain. Muslims are like one body. These are the teachings of Islam. And another narration, uh, the Prophet ﷺ said, Muslims amongst each other are like one person. So there's pain in his eye, then his whole body aches. And if there is a headache, then his whole body feels the pain. This is in Sahih Muslim. So we need to show that compassion, affection towards one another. And killing is, Allahu Akbar, the complete opposite to showing compassion and mercy and affection to one another. It's showing hatred for one another. Is showing enmity for one another, extreme opposition to one another. Muslims should not be like this. Today, people kill others over trivial matters, over small matters. He looked at me in the wrong way. He spoke to me in the wrong way. Afterwards, they'll say, my anger got the better of you. Your anger got the better of you? You destroyed a whole family. You've taken their child away. You, you destroyed them by killing the sole breadwinner in the family. And people don't think like this. People, today, there's so much rage inside us road rage and then there's rage in other ways as well and people are not shy in expressing that as well demonstrating that as well sometimes they 
They boast about him. I showed him. You know, I put him in his place. Allah, we should be humble believers. And we should not boast about things like this. Moving on, uh, another way of killing yourselves, the scholars mention, is by committing suicide. And suicide is haram. No matter how many difficulties you go through, whatever struggle you're going through, لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها. Allah will not place a burden upon you more than you can bear. You will go through that test. You will come out successful, Allah willing. But you have to be patient. And taking one's life is not the solution. It's not the way. In fact, the hadith mentions that the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever commits suicide by throwing himself from a mountain will keep falling down in the hellfire forever. And whoever commits suicide by eating poison, he will continue eating poison in the hellfire forever. And whoever commits suicide using an iron weapon, he will carry that weapon in his hand and wound himself in the hellfire. Allahu Akbar. So there is no afiyah, there is no well-being, there is no goodness and benefit in committing suicide. A person should face that struggle, trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And inshallah when he comes out successful, he will realize that this was a great test that Allah placed him in. And it was for his betterment, subhanAllah. So suicide is something that Muslims should never involve themselves in. And lastly, another way of killing yourselves, the scholars mention is by going through a hunger strike. Now people do that today or consuming wealth in an unlawful way. This is another way of killing oneself. And there's a beautiful narration, Sayyidina Amr bin Aas radiallahu anhu said, uh, in one battle, he had to do ghusl. He had nocturnal emission. It was a very cold night. And instead of taking ghusl, he did tayammum because he was afraid that if he took a bath, it would endanger his life. He could lose his life. So this was mentioned to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet alayhi wa sallam said that you perform tayammum instead of ghusl. And he says, I replied, Ya Rasulullah this is what caused me to uh, do tayammum instead of take a bath. And I have heard the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, وَلَا تَقْتُلُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ كَانَ بِكُمْ رَحِيمًا Do not kill yourselves, Allah is most merciful to you. And then listening to this, the Prophet ﷺ smiled and did not say anything. So subhanAllah, today we covered not consuming wealth unlawfully, performing trade with good intentions, and lastly, not killing ourselves and the various forms of that were also discussed. May Allah Jalla wa ala enable us to remember and act upon what has been said. Ameen bidahin nabil ameen sallallahu alayhi wa sallam.